So hello and welcome everyone. Um, so my name's Faye Ronaldo and I'm working part-time at the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation as the fundraising coordinator. Um, but here I'm today, today I'm here to moderate our discussion. And I'd like first of all to extend a warm welcome to everyone and thank you for your, your curiosity and your drive. Um, and the collaborative spirit that you bring in joining this group today. Um, so who do we have here today? Well, you guys are all the experts in ecosystem restoration and we have a real great mix of expertise here today from all different backgrounds and all involved in the restoration movement in different ways. And you'll have the chance to meet each other and speak during the breakout rooms. But if you'd already like to, I see some people have already introduced themselves in the chat if you'd like to continue to introduce yourselves and um, perhaps along with your name and your your work you might also if you'd like to open the space for further discussion then emails are also very welcome. Um, so before we launch into it let's introduce the focus for today and so today is all about implementing a global evaluation and monitoring protocol that can help qualify and quantify the results that can be seen at camps. And so we've, in, we've established a, a monitoring and evaluation framework, and we'd like to present that to you uh, and invite reflection, and then we'll continue to work with your insights over time. And so next to this, the focus is to, as we do that, to address the practicalities of implementing this framework. And the program for today is, uh, we're starting now, we'll, it will be two hours and we'll have a 10 minute break. John will begin with an introduction to the event and uh, share his vision, I think, of ecosystem restoration camps as living labs. Then Peter will share a little, um, oh, here we go, we have the presentation. Peter will share a little about um, the monitoring and evaluation work at the foundation. And then Nick will share the monitoring and evaluation framework that he has been coordinating. What do we hope for today? So we really hope that today is going to show how data matters and provide that inspiration for us to, to collectively gather that data. Um, and I also, we also hope that today is going to help to connect up different um, people, so connect up camp coordinators with experts um, to answer the monitoring and evaluation based questions going forward. So the spirit of today is all about collaborative inquiry and joint collaboration, really, yeah, co-ownership. Um, a few practicals. The first thing is, it's really helpful if you could put your microphones on mute. Um, and then before you speak, you can, of course, take yourself off mute. And perhaps you can also close your videos that will help with the bandwidth of, um, to make sure that the presentations and the speeches can come through properly. And today will be a recorded session. We'll be sharing the notes after. Um, a couple of ground rules that will help the conversation to go a little smoothly. You can use the chat function, uh, the raising hand function. So if you see under reactions, there's a little tab called reactions at the bottom of your Zoom page and you can click raise hand and that will help me to see who wants to, um, who wants to speak. And there'll be lots of opportunity for everyone to speak. We will be, after the presentations, we'll be going into breakout sessions and uh, reporting back on discussing the questions that, that arise through through today. So if you could share your questions as they come up into the chat, then we'll be fielding those to the speakers and to the groups later. So all questions, all comments welcome in the chat box um, as we go through today. I think that's all the key ground rules. So just a reminder, please turn off your microphones and your video during the presentations and please do share your questions and comments in the chat box and we'll be making sure that we're addressing those during the breakout sessions. Okay without further ado let's begin with John. So I think everyone everyone knows John. John became well known 
uh, through his through his um, film Green Gold and, and <clears throat> Hope in a Changing Climate. And since the filming of the restoration of the Lost Plateau, he's been focused himself on the science of ecosystem restorations. He is the founder of Ecosystem Restoration Camps and ambassador of the Common Land Foundation and a well-known international speaker, probably known to all of us. So John, without further ado, would you like to begin? Thank you, Faye. Um, thank you everyone for being here. It's uh, really an honor to be able to speak to all of you. Um, there's a constant need to uh, realize kind of how um, serious the situation is and yet we have to go beyond this seriousness to how can we actually act and one thing that i noticed as i was documenting and observing and studying ecosystems around the world over the last three decades was that there's a very small group of people who are working in this area and that there's so many more people who are working on the land and it's those people who are working on the land that are having the biggest impacts but they often don't know exactly what to do and for a long time i i just wanted everyone to understand and i tried really hard to tell people what I was learning. So you can find everything that I've ever, ever thought about this in my writing or in my films, because I just immediately put it on to, on, I put it out somewhere. Sometimes it was in broadcasting and sometimes it was just in other ways, but I, I came to the conclusion that we were going way too slow and that the crises would start to pile up and the fact is they have been piling up and in in thinking about this i i realized that we have to have uh, a type of collective consciousness that we need to act as a species on a planetary scale and i i was started to think of this as collaborative inquiry for collective intelligence because i realized it didn't matter what i learned if it didn't spread to everybody in the world and that I had a role to play, but I wasn't really that important ultimately in the outcome that it would be determined by others and by all of us. So that's kind of where I began to think about the concept of ecosystem restoration camps. And what I realized was that when you start to actually work on the land, we don't, we don't actually have a theoretical problem. We have a physical problem and it's not a single physical problem. It's collapsing ecosystems. So it's all of the different symbiotic systems that are working together that are starting to fail. So when one fails, there are other failures because there are uh, feedback loops. And the more I learned about this, the more uh, urgent I started to feel that this was. And the more I tried to tell people <laughs> how important it was, and the less I felt um, sort of uh, confident that we were on the right path. And an interesting thing has happened through COVID there has been a kind of a break 
in business as usual. And it hasn't changed the outcomes in terms of the increasing crises that we're facing. But I think a lot more people have been focusing and we have a lot of things that are very positive. But with the need to go fast and the need to work together um, was the basis of, of creating this. And what we see now is that we have to do this kind of monitoring and assessment, and we have to have a very broad uh, view. Because what I've, what I've seen is that we have multi-dimensional symbiotic systems on the planet. So the hydrological cycle. Uh oh. The hydrological cycle, the soil fertility, the biodiversity, the percentages and total amounts of of organic material, and the height of the canopy. These are all um elements of regulatory systems and life support systems on the earth and human civilization human humanity over historical time has been building infrastructure has been extracting from this as we all know and now the situation among people who are not studying this or not aware of this is very confused. So they're being told in school and by their families and in their work that they need to do other things. They need to manufacture and buy and sell things that somehow that's going to help. And that's been elevated to the point where it's more important than the natural ecological systems in the normal sort of dominant economic and political system. And this um, also shows us that we John, have been We're approaching 10 minutes, so to make I sure know, that we I'm have time. Stop. Well, perhaps you might like to share briefly, just to conclude, but also share about your vision of the living labs. Well, I think that the camps are the living laboratories. That's what I'm trying to, 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 to say. I'm saying that we have the chance to all work together and it's coming together and I'm, I'm pleased to see it. And um, I'm, I'm so glad that you're all out there. And uh, please take over, Faye, take me away. Great, thanks, thanks, uh, John. Okay, um, you're muted uh, yourself, eh? <laughs> classic, <laughs> classic. So thanks, John. Um, quick tip because it's going to be particularly helpful for Mick and Peter's presentations. You can, if you don't already have your screen set so that you can see speaker view instead of gallery view. It's really helpful for you to see the presentations now. Okay, so um, Peter now is going to talk to us about um, the foundation perspective on monitoring and evaluation. And um, let me scroll back to where we are. So Peter is the executive director of Ecosystem Restoration Camps, and he spent the last 30 years in both the NGO and the corporate community, focusing on achieving sustainability at IUCN, in banking and at the Natural Capital Coalition. And uh, so he's going to talk now about how the foundation is currently helping the camp movement to monitor and evaluate their work. Take it away, Peter. Thanks, Faye. Uh, and thanks, John. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to briefly touch upon, I know many camps are here too, and I, I know it's a struggle for camps to take on monitoring and evaluation. I think monitoring and evaluation is a struggle for anyone undertaking any project. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, spend some time 
explaining why I think it's really important. John just explained that we as field labs can help uh, the world move forward on good techniques. Uh, but for that, you do need data. And um, primarily, you do monitoring evaluation to see if you're on the right track. Uh, the infamous plan do check act cycle uh, where uh, and Mick uh, after me will dig a bit deeper in that where our framework fits in. But, you know, you have a plan, you start to work, you check somewhere if you're doing the right thing still, you pull your lessons, you change your plan, and the whole cycle repeats itself. That's the primary reason why you should do monitoring and evaluation. Uh, but we would like to add another layer. Uh, we are more activists than just making sure our project is the best ever. We're also trying to persuade the rest of the world that restored ecosystems and uh, regenerative uh, agriculture or other regenerative practices practices within those ecosystems for the people that will still live there uh, are a, a good idea and we need to prove that in a language that people understand so if you look at the development of ERC um, you know we started with one camp in Spain and that one camp in Spain communicated a great deal through social media and that inspired others to say hey I like the idea of, uh, of 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 camping as a way to get people to come help in ecosystem restoration, and we as a foundation have been set up to facilitate that. So we're setting in place the IT infrastructure for knowledge exchange, getting volunteers to come to camps, uh, everything you need to, uh, you know, a very large group work together. Uh, so IT platform based, we think will facilitate large groups uh much better than uh account managers would uh behind a phone uh and it's working because we're already uh at 38 projects that uh have uh very graciously agreed to join the ecosystem restoration camps movement and uh work together to restore uh what, can, what needs to be restored within the project space and introduce those regenerative practices but we've also agreed to share with the world what we're doing in the hope that we uh, inspire everyone, because everyone in the end needs to be inspired to uh, find a role within ecosystems, with ecosystems, and, um, uh, and live in a way that the planet can carry humanity forward for a very long time. Thank um, you. So, Camps for us are points of inspiration uh, with the, uh, well, I'm also host and I can mute people uh, in this case. Uh, camps are points of inspiration and we need evidence to show that we're on the right track. And this works. This is anecdotal evidence. This is that first camp in Spain where you see a regreening after only three years. Uh, you also see the monoculture in the back growing, uh, but you see there's an impact. And that for lots of people works because there's an intuitive relationship to what you see in those images. Uh, when I saw Paul, uh, John's film in 2009, uh, that change from the desertified Lush Plateau to the very green and lush Lush Plateau, you intuitively felt the latter bit was the better world to live in. And we can show that also in a quantified way. And uh, for many of the so-called audiences in ecosystem restoration camps, those quantified approaches are important. Uh, for the volunteers, the campers, as we call them, when they go to camps, to um, sort of feel that what, that what they do and contribute to is scientifically sound. So we're doing tests to show that what we're doing is sound is important and uh, an added benefit also for, uh, because it's difficult to do all these tests, they may actually enjoy doing the tests and we and Nick will show them or we'll talk about them. We've designed tests that are actually kind of fun to do. Uh, in our world, we're still regretfully mostly charity funded. Uh, charities really like log frames and quantified uh, uh, proof that their money was spent properly. Uh, so we need it for that too. Uh, and some of these funding streams might be part of payment for ecosystem service uh schemes carbon 
or might want to contribute to biodiversity goals or poverty and hunger goals and would like to show their um, supporters that what they're doing in a quantified way works. So these are just two groups very close to the camps that are interested in quantified data outside the anecdotal data. Uh, but now it gets interesting for that scaling uh, question. If we can show that we're sequestering car carbon, if we can show that we're helping um, preserve biodiversity, if we can show we're in improving livelihoods of communities and people and farmers in those areas, other communities in the region, neighboring farmers uh, may want to be convinced to change practices, to join up in the broader ecosystem restoration movement and to start to adopt some of those uh, practices that have been showcased at camps. And uh, I know that for a great majority of the camps currently in the movement, there is an interest to help those neighbors uh, move, move forward in that sense. And then finally, uh, um, you know, it's the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Uh, we can contribute to the data gathering and the scientific community that is really moving forward very fast on this uh, issue. Um, I know Bethany is here. Uh, we just had a very long discussion on what is net gain? How, how, how do we put the metrics in place? And perhaps we can be places where we test those, the, the concepts being developed and see uh, if we can show that we are indeed not just improving the ecology, but also improving the lives of people that live within that restored region. And then when it comes to data, uh, we have the sustainable development goals. They each have a whole bunch of sub targets. Most of them are quantified. Can we show that what we're doing contributes to those goals and hence get buy in from the policymakers into ecosystem restoration? Because we may think now the decade on ecosystem restoration is here, but there have been many decades in the past and uh, policy coherence is a, is a thing within governments. Uh, and maybe if we can prove that for multiple regions of interest in governments, this is important, uh, we can uh, achieve further momentum for ecosystem restoration. So um, what have we built? And Nick will explain it further, is a, a, a testable framework on soil, which is our ecological aspects. And now we have a coral reef camp maybe joining us and there is a mangrove planting camp uh, and there's a coastal zone. But soil is uh, where we're focusing on, and we may have to develop further indicators for the individual, the transformative experience that people have when they're in the midst of ecosystem restoration. We've developed uh, tests and indicators to find out what's happening on the soil side. And then there is the society side, which I just described. What can we do as a foundation and as a community of camps to help each other do better monitoring and evaluation? Well, first of all, we think it's really important to bring monitoring and evaluation to the level of the practitioner and the communities and the farmers. It needs to be as much as possible layperson implementable. And we're looking for those tests. And in our conversation today, we'll see if we're, if we're getting if we're on the right track. Uh, we're working with Zendesk on building a knowledge and training platform right now that we can upload videos on with how-tos on, but we can also have discussions on improving those tests within that uh, platform to see if we're doing the right thing. We're building partnerships. Uh, we've just signed up with Restore, with Crowder Labs, so that remote sensing can take part of the burden away. Uh, and all we have to do is um, calibrate what the... Uh, satellites are showing us. And then we're trying to figure out if we can set up partnerships with local universities so that we can get students to come over or maybe other campers to come over and help do the tests. Um, it's a... I'm there almost say. Great. We've launched today a fundraiser to get tools to camps because we know that's sometimes an issue. Data logging infrared thermometers or penetrometers. That campaign just started. So we're looking for funding for this too. And then, you know, we're underway. Uh, let's get the rest to follow and let's uh, show and prove that what we're doing is the right thing to do. Okay, I'm done. Great, thanks, Peter. Yes, well, now 
And I'm really excited to hear this. Mick is going to be sharing with us the monitoring and evaluation framework. And Mick is an intern from Wageningen University, which is considered one of the, the world's top universities and particularly renowned for its life sciences specialism. So it's been really amazing to have Mick working with us, um, not least for his enthusiasm and commitment. And he's also been coordinating the monitoring and evaluation um, effort. So he has redeveloped the ecological tests and he will present the framework to you now. And again, as Mick goes through this, I'd like to invite you to, to contribute your questions and your comments into the chat function. And we'll be making sure to collect those to um, go into breakout discussions in the second half. Well, thank you, Faye, and uh, thank you everyone for being here today. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be able to share some of the stuff I've been working on and uh, explore how this can look like at the ground of uh, camps worldwide. So, Peter, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, before we really dive into uh, the exercise, just a few central questions to my inquiry. Um, first, as Peter already touched upon, uh, obviously we wonder why, why should we care about monitoring and evaluation and for who is it important? Um, how can this be a learning exercise that is also transformative and promoting a greater connection to nature and a sense of belonging in, in the face of these complex crises of our times? Then um, if this is possible, how do we empower ordinary people uh, by doing monitoring and evaluation? And what is the stuff they will be measuring or what are the camps trying to reach? Obviously, one question I'm really hoping to explore with all of you later today is um, what are the challenges and opportunities when we do monitoring and evaluation at such unique and uh, often quite remote ecosystems? One question that was uh, kept coming back during the redevelopment of this framework was, um, and I quote this from Roland, who I believe is here, today as well. Um, how do we create something that is uh, robust and useful at a scientific level, but is also not dependent on people's background experience and knowledge? Next slide. So um, how did I dive into these? Uh, first, I had a pleasure to work with two data collectors. Uh, they were at Camp Altiplano and Mama Adama in 2020 and a very, very constructive feedback came from there. Then I also dove into the classic uh, deep rabbit holes of the literature and was able to harvest some good insights there too. And um, as most of you probably did during uh, this pandemic, I had quite some online meetings and here is one with uh, Wouter van Eck who shared with us some of the outcomes he's been able to measure in his amazing food forest in Nijmegen. All of this gave me a lot of food to digest and to make sense of. And um, yeah, let's see what, what it gave, gave me and gave us. Peter? So uh, why should camps... Peter told you a little bit about um, why monitoring and evaluation is important for different uh, members of the global ecosystem restoration community. Um, I'm focusing a bit more on why it's important for the camps themselves and the work they're doing on the ground. Well, first of all, it, it helps camps to really start understanding their local ecology and uh, their own guesses about how, how things have come to be the way they are. Um, what are the pressures that are being put on the ecosystems and why are they in such a not so pretty state? And also, of course, we're very interested in knowing what kind of actions or restoration interventions will help to um, restore these ecosystems and push them into a more desirable condition. So all of this is part of a vast learning cycle and, and uh, adaptive management loop that camps can engage throughout their work. In doing so, we can also create some uh, figures of the impacts the global movement is having on the world and share this with, uh, with the wider world so that we can also increase the legitimacy of uh, the work of ecosystem restoration camps. Next slide. So um, how does this all fit together and work alongside uh, many other things that need to happen at the camps? 
So uh, at the top, you see here in this chart, the ecosystem pressures I just told about and the collapsing ecosystems, as John mentioned, um, what, what is wrong? And from there, people obviously have started to reimagine uh, what could be there instead and lush ecosystems with uh, native species and local wildlife and so on. This can be translated in restoration goals and objectives, which in turn can be um, linked to certain interventions through conceptual models and so on. So here's the bit of the hypothesis that camps can, can start to explore. In turn, this will allow camps to design and put these things on, on their site maps so they know exactly what they are going to do where. And as this is done, they can engage in monitoring and evaluation so that they can account for um, unintended outcomes and reevaluate the work and integrate this in what they are doing. Camps then uh, are able to respond not only where this data is coming from, but also by sharing this with the wider community can create a, a massive response uh, so that everyone is informed by this kind of work. You can go to the next slide, Peter. So all of these um, elements, I, I started grouping them into what I'm calling different stages of development. Um, and so here at the top of this donut, uh, the visioning and planning stages are more preparatory or theoretical perhaps. And then uh, down below is what camps are all about, the actual restoration work on the ground and also some critical thinking and pondering about what, what is working, what is not working. And then back up, as I mentioned before, the response and the adaptive management cycle. Next slide. So <laughs> that's uh, where the framework sits. It's hovering around some doing. Obviously, we need to be collecting data on the ground. And this is why we have a set of protocols that I will talk about in just a minute. Um, but also, it has a lot to do with the sense-making part of it. So um, camps can really incorporate the knowledge and the understanding they're building on at the camps to improve their work and um, yeah, become better at restoring ecosystems. So I think uh, by now, most of you have received a preliminary version of our framework. Um, as Peter mentioned today, we're focusing on the soil, or I think it's more accurate to talk about ecological outcomes. These are listed here in the left column, and it's, it's a lot of them, and it, they're not all necessarily relevant for all the camps. These outcomes are the things that we hope camps uh, will be working towards. And so we created a set of indicators that will show whether the camps are on the right track and path to, to reach those. And these indicators will be associated with quantities or quantitative or qualitative data that comes from the different means of verification on the right column or the different ecological tests. In yellow, you see a few tests that are still being developed. So we're continuously improving uh, the content of the framework, which will lead to many versions of the framework that are always uh, enriched by what is found at the camps. Next slide, Peter. So here's just um, a little example of how these indicators look like in the framework. We have for each indicator and test a little bit of context so people know why they're uh, researching on certain uh, ecological attributes. And then very much like a recipe book, we have a list with the materials and step-by-step -step method. And at the end, there's a section uh, with the results which will give you an indication of what, what you'll probably be getting and maybe also how you want to be um, setting your objectives. So for some attributes, we, we talk about a, an optimum curve and you don't want to be increasing things infinitely like pH, but for other things, you actually may want to be increasing a variable over time as much as you can, like reducing the soil compaction or uh, water retention in the soil. Next slide. In this uh, redeveloped version of the framework, we also touched upon a sampling design and um, proposed stratified sampling is a 
very uh, common method in ecological research and helps people to really uh, find out where they need to sample and collect data from in all the different zones of a camp. We also um, talk about the time frame so people know what's the right timing to execute some of these tests and also know how this can become aligned with the work that is happening at other camps. Then we also have some instructions on how people can record this data. So some things will be uh, pictures, other, other data will fall into these uh, spreadsheets. And we, for now, we have a few different tabs for each of the indicators and tests that um, camps will be monitoring. And we also are developing a template that will help camps communicate their findings and um, share the results. Next slide. So uh, what now? We have impact measurements planned for around 10 camps. It's a small sample, but it's um, really valuable at this stage. It's also going to be a phase of trial and error where we will figure out what indicators work best where and whether they're actually feasible to uh, implement at the camps. We will also uh, meet some more context specific metrics um, that are more suitable to specific biomes and the tropics. I mean, we realize there's a, a strong bias in this framework, of course, towards terrestrial ecosystems and a more temperate climate. And the foundation is also uh, working on making sure this is all done in a creative commons context and um, the data is analyzed in the long term too. We're also aware of uh, the danger of um, perverse incentives that may arise from having data collected at so many different locations. And so we really, the last thing we want to see is of course, um, camps being replaced by monocropping systems. So it's just uh, a few things that I think will will be following up. And now I really look forward to engaging in a conversation and uh, hearing, hearing all about your experiences and relevant knowledge. Thank you. Great, thanks Mick. And I see my connection's a little unstable, so let's see if this works now. Um, now, I'd like to bring the floor to you guys and hear your thoughts and reflections and we'll go into breakout rooms we'll take a little break and we'll go into breakout rooms but perhaps i can take just a couple of first comments from from people um does someone have some initial reflections to share i am just this is charlene i'm just joining in now because i had the previous meeting which ended a few minutes ago so i just uh, sorry i couldn't attend before Hi, Charling. I see my connection's a bit unstable. If um, if it doesn't, perhaps Peter wants to take over from me if it continues to be unstable like this. Just say, just say it, and I'll do it. Yeah, perhaps you can. But for you're, now, you're coming take over the... very clear and very. Oh, it is. Good for us. Okay, yeah. so it's just what I hear then. So let's just keep going and see how it goes. So does someone have a couple of uh, reflections, some first reflections to share back about mix? Uh, framework that he's just presented, or the framework makers just presented. I see there's a raised hand. Yes, Igor. Igor, I can see your hand is raised. Hello. Yeah, I was uh, reading about the, at first, thank you for the explanation, Mick. I was reading the framework because uh, I'm going to be collecting data. And then kind of this question came to me. Uh, it was more an idea of uh, maybe partnering with uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, or maybe bird watcher somehow to, yeah because it was not so clear, it's a lot of an approach focusing on the soil, uh, how it impacts the soil over the time. But my question would be more about, uh, yeah, biodiversity. Is there already an idea how we are evaluating this impact in the biodiversity? Especially my 
special interest is birds, but of course animals as well, insects, other camps bringing plants that are essential, not only for the products that they would bring, but what they could support for biodiversity for the local insects and yeah, other animals in general. Yeah, well, it's a very, very interesting subject. And um, it's one of the things that John Liu also uh, always refers to as, you know, functional ecosystems depend on biodiversity. And um, I see Ika Jukic from Decomposition uh, has already shared a very useful resource for um, biodiversity monitoring and surveys. What we are also um, doing now, we've organized a little sub team uh, with Roland, Fran and uh, Todd, they're all present here today. And we are looking into ways of um, serving biodiversity and also incorporating more camp specific tests. So we're thinking of looking at um, generalist and specialist species um, specific to, uh, to, the, to the camps. And this can be different groups, whether that's insects or um, birds, it doesn't really matter. And then maybe we, we are able to find out a way of calculating ratios and also uh, draw global pictures about improvements in biodiversity due to the work of ecosystem restoration camps. Other than that, we have for now uh, the nocturnal insect test that is very simple and involves was one of my favorites when I uh, had to try them out. It's just uh, hanging up a light sheet and, uh, or sorry, a bed sheet and shining light on it and waiting for them to come. So it's very, very easy to monitor that over time. And we also are thinking of using these tools like iNaturalist uh, to stimulate people to go out and really absorb what they're witnessing and, and take in any, any special encounters with nature. Yes, and I also see here a comment from Elaine, we should avoid using use of indirect or hard to Im interpret assays, I see here. Could you clarify that a little, Elaine, or speak to that comment? I have to get unmuted first, that always takes a few seconds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, assays being fairly synonymous with tests or assessments. Um, we want to avoid those things that can be interpreted several ways. Like any time you're measuring carbon dioxide um, being evolved from the soil or from any particular part of the, the system, you need to know the underlying sets of microorganisms to know for certain who all is producing that CO2. Is it mostly bacterial? Is it mostly fungal? Is it a equal combination? How important are the predators in that system? Because I know microbiologists tend to say, well, it's mostly the bacteria, the fungi that are actually producing the CO2. And I can give you data that shows that no, that's not true. That sometimes you have huge numbers of the predators in that system and most of the CO2 is coming from those predators, not from what you think is going on. So I kind of have a problem with um, those things where you're measuring uh, um, some response or some um, part of the system and you don't have a really good handle on what that release of CO2 actually means. That's a specific example. There are any number of other examples one can use, but we wanna really look at what each of the assays or each of the tests, each of the assessments are, um, are what's actually producing that response. Okay. Yeah, that's really clear. And, and a really helpful insight also that really speaks to um, also our uh, purpose for today because we're really working to engage citizen science and and people on the ground to do this restoration work and to to measure that impact and so to have that insight is really helpful to make sure that we're really aligned in our monitoring and evaluation framework so i think we're going to dive into that in more depth now in the breakout sessions 
Um, and we'll, we've been quite structured in this first part because we really wanted to make sure that uh, your time has is used wisely while you're here. But the next bit is really about you sharing um, your reflections and collaboratively inquiring into this collaboratively. But first, let's take a 10 minute break. And uh, I'd love to, I'd like to ask you to be back uh, in 10 minutes quite sharply. I see Lucas, uh, you have your hand raised, perhaps we can address, perhaps you can um, comment your, write your question in the chat and then we can make sure that we address that in the breakout rooms now. Um, so if you're back in 10 minutes, we'll start with the breakout sessions. And then we'll come back, report back to the group, and then we'll have a second set of breakout, uh, breakout rooms where we can dive into the questions that you've been sharing in the chat. And I can see there are some really interesting questions in the chat here. So thank you and uh, welcome, you're welcome to continue to add more questions. Um, so without, oh, a clarification of the questions then. So the first uh, one question that half of the breakout rooms will be exploring now is is, is the framework aligned with research on ecosystem restoration and so that might include um, thinking about whether the methods are scientifically robust and um, how different camps can use different types of tests how we could standardize those materials and so forth you'll explore that further in the groups the second question we'll be looking at is how do we implement monitoring and evaluation at camps on the ground? So how can we support camps with uh, implementing that framework? How could they practically collect that data and financial mechanisms that could cover that equipment? So that's all within the topic of how do we implement monitoring and evaluation at camps? Two questions. So we'll spend uh, 20 minutes together in breakout rooms and I'm sure that it's not enough to really delve into the nitty gritty of everything but let's uh, spark those those ideas and raise those critical questions that we can continue to explore collaboratively going forward. So without further ado you will receive an invite now to join uh, a breakout room everyone yes, <laughs> first of all you. uh Jan well we'll begin by having uh, all the note takers just feedback on what's been discussed before we go into the next session but Jan Hein would you like to take a minute to update us yeah do, do, do we have a specific style in, in which we want to do this or can I just reflect on some of the things that are being said that were said okay. yeah exactly what suits so um an idea that was raised was add soil temperature to uh, to measure our MNA framework, which was not really the question, but it was uh, an effort I wanted to uh, uh, name here. But some of the things that we could do in order to help uh, the MNA framework uh, being implemented at the camp level is connect to local universities or local institutions uh, to help um, create a standardized toolbox. Uh, with the uh, measuring and effect, uh, the tools in it uh, that we can use for all the camps. Um, there was a question, uh, and it's nice to reflect upon, is how much low tech do we want to use versus high tech in measuring the data? So, you know, we can talk to the Google Earth and, and have all these automated instruments. Um, um, but how much low tech versus high tech do we want to use? Further, uh, we could use weather stations uh, uh, and connect through Wi-Fi uh, and uh, gather data on that way on an automated level. Uh, it was said that the, it should be simple and it could be it should be used by everybody. Um, there was a question or a comment that said, you know, please use something like a Google form uh, and send a reminder to fill in the data uh, because it's not a top priority for some of the camp managers. <laughs> and feel that you feel that you're being part of a global group that is filling in the data. So you know the, the, the feeling that you're lagging behind the rest, for example. Um, there was a, a point raised by John that says, you know, can we use proactive adaptive realization with real-time data, which allows for a, a, a trend, a graphic display on, on what's happening. Uh, 
then productivity should follow function. Uh, and part of the data, uh, and that was where we ended our discussion, uh, should be done maybe automated by example, uh, we, we should approach Google Earth and help us collect the data in an automated way. So these were some of the points that uh, we came up to. Cool, thanks Jan-Hein. And we'll be sending a report or um, notes for what we've collated today. Uh, Ash, would you like to feed back on your group? Yes, indeed. Hello everyone. Um, okay, so we were answering the question about how our framework can align with other research on ecosystem restoration. Um, and my group had mainly camp coordinators uh, or people working at the camps as data collectors and Bethany from the Society for Eco Ecological Restoration. Um, and she started off by telling us that she's part of a group that's working with the UN Decade to develop a set of common indicators for any biome that's still being developed. Um, and there are loads of tools out there but they're not really aligned or joined up and in may there'll be a draft that we can look at um and she also said when we do monitoring make sure it's holistic to look at a suite of indicators and metrics so that we can be sure that we know how things um, are working together and interacting and then sylvia said um there are certain tests that are more relevant to certain camps so there should be a basic set of tests that all the camps do and then extra tests that are more specific with what the camps are doing in their contexts. Daniel from Via Organica suggested that we create an online platform so that we can upload our results as CSV or GIS files um, and this is a, an open source place where anyone can take the data and use it for further research. Um, then we spoke more in detail about scientific robustness when, where, when it comes to the camps all having exactly the same equipment. And I gave an example from Bolivia where they would like to get started on data collection now. Um, otherwise they need to wait until February, which is when the next rainy season comes around. And uh, we were wondering whether they should order the same penetrometer as the ca other camps in Europe are using, for instance, which will take three months to arrive. Um, and Bethany and others said that it's more important to collect the data and as long as the same materials are used at the camp year on year, the, that comparison is more important than the same exact tools being used at different sites around the world. Um, yeah, so that was, that was basically what we discussed and it's all written down on the Jamboard if anyone else wants to have a look. We're um, breakout room one, session one. Thanks. Uh, Scott, would you like to share? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um... We had a great discussion um, and a few what I think are really valuable questions for, were raised. Maybe the, uh, the biggest is, is how can we translate the data that we gather through these tests into meaningful um, action and adaptation on the site uh, at the camp? And so um, I'm sorry I didn't write down who, who brought up these ideas, but um, the Part of the concept is that we can use this data to better inform conversations between the camp managers and advisors and experts within the ecosystem restoration camps community so that the camp can make better choices about design and strategy and especially in monitoring the change in biodiversity that the camp can make better decisions about um, which, uh, for example, plants to focus on um, planting and propagating at the camp. Um, someone asked a great question about uh, creating videos which would demonstrate how to do each of the tests and 
I thought that could be a really valuable addition to uh, the knowledge base um, that we can record uh, these videos and create more detailed um, instruction sheets for each of the tests. Um, and then the last uh, big question that we brought up in the group was um, how can we um, address more uh, social, uh, the social benefits of ecosystem restoration within uh, the framework. Um, and so I think it was Charling offered up a link um, of a, of a monitoring project that has some relevant concepts. And another concept that we brought up is looking at the impact on uh, neighbors like farms and landowners who are starting to adapt to more sustainable and restorative practices. Um, and that, that can be an easy to measure um, metric if there's such and such number of neighbors who have incorporated at least one restorative practice uh, mm. on their land. That ties in nicely actually to one of the topics we'll be looking at in the next section, so to be continued. Um, <laughs> Melissa, would you like to, and perhaps we can uh, try and keep some is a little bit shorter to leave enough time for discussions in the next. No problem, ours were pretty consolidated. Um, so in breakout room six, we were discussing how best to implement monitoring and evaluation at the camps. And we had some great input. Uh, let's see, one of the ways uh, the group felt that ERC could be helpful was uh, arranging for local experts to actually come in and be there side to side with our camp coordinators to help them assess um, uh, well, their learnings and their monitor, their, their evaluation. Um, so that way they could be asking questions in person and that actually helps create more excitement in the camps. Also, uh, something that was brought up, which I feel is really important is uh, potentially having uh, camp, specific camp manuals for each camp on uh, monitoring and evaluation so that when people come in, they know exactly what to expect within the framework and m and &E. and uh, the manual they feel that really should be easily understandable, translatable, and easy to employ. And lastly, this, this was really everybody agreed upon is that they feel that what's best for m and &E is having, they wanna know what, if, if having automated data is better or if yearly feedback, is data, uh, feedback data is better. So how often should we be monitoring and how much is enough? So discussing this with each camp uh, and how much data collection is actually feasible and realistic is really important. Great. That's also another question that came out from the chat and will be one of the next topics. So cool to be continued as well. Uh, Kath, do you want to? Yeah, so um, we had um, a really good discussion around looking at is the framework aligned with research or with current research on, on ecosystem restoration and how can it, um, is it poised really to contribute towards that? Um, Dr. Len Ingham said that we, we really do need to, to ensure that we're looking more at examining the, the underground. So we're examining the soil to understand what is going on uh, below the ground to inform what is going on above the ground and we need to look at the biology in the soil to get a more holistic understanding. Um, she also mentioned that that classes at the, the Soil Food Web School will teach people how to use microscopes to do simple tests to come to some conclusions about the biology which is really important before one gets going with the testing. Um, also, we had uh, um, Igor in our group who mentioned that uh, we uh, we need to we, it's it's not probably not a good idea to have a general approach in in each place. We really need to be looking at the natural evolution of of the ecology in each place, and that it's um, maybe not wise to apply the same metrics to to different biomes. So we really need to first look at um, what exists in each place and how we can can support that. Elaine Ingham also added to that, that we need to, to define where in succession the study uh, currently is uh, to see whether we're going in the right direction um, and to understand the biology. Then we also delved into looking at um, 
can we use generic tools or the, the more sort of DIY tools or, or alternatives at some of the camps to speed up the process to get going? Or do we need to wait until we have standardized equipment at each of the camps? Um, the feeling from uh, Dr. Ingham was that we don't need lots of, of sophisticated equipment, for example, the petrometers, which are expensive, sorry, the penetrometers, bit of a tongue twister. And, and that we could use things like, like metal rods, for example, um, to measure compaction of the soil, which would provide adequate uh, feedback and, and information. Um, Ego actually responded to that, though, to say a very valid point, and that's that if we're going to use alternative equipment, we need to have a little bit more training in place to ensure that there is some standardization and that mm. these alternative equipments are used in a... Um, a uniform fashion to ensure that the, the results that we achieve are uh, still scientifically robust. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christina, and I'm going to ask you to do it as short and sweet as possible. All right, I'll be quick. So at the beginning of our discuss discussion, um, we really reflected on uh, the main questions behind the, the framework. So uh, why are we implementing the, this framework and uh, what, what are we measuring and uh, for whom are we doing this? So this is uh, something that was highlighted as very important to really have a clear uh, mission, a clear direction, to really know um where we are heading this is a very important thing and it was highlighted uh, through all, uh, all of our discussion um then this also led us to answering a very important fundraising question that uh, um where do we find actually the the um, funding to help us uh buy the instruments that are needed and uh, and so on and whenever these questions are clear, whenever the, the direction is clear um, for the experience of uh, the people who were in my breakout room, sorry, I forgot also to write down who said what, but for, from their experience, uh, this is really what um, will take us uh, to, to have a clear picture for the funders and therefore to have our needs funded. So um, then we focus a lot on concrete actions and um, basically um, we focused on how to bring volunteers to the camps and it's important um, to uh, have like a sort of certificate that could be handed to these volunteers because many people are actually looking for a sort of recognition for the work and the time that they're offering so this is something we we could consider uh, this would definitely help us uh, yeah collect uh, and find, find more volunteers. Um, then it would also be good to, uh, for volunteers not to um, basically take, a, take with them the, all the skills that they have uh, been learning during their journey, but to share them with, with other volunteers. So to make sure that this knowledge stays inside and sort of creating training of trainers for, for volunteers. And other, uh, I'll try to be very quick, other very important topics that were touched were also uh, developing traditions and record keeping in monitoring and evaluation. This is also very important and uh, sort of establishing a research protocol, uh, which basically uh, means to have, again, uh, questions that are clear, uh, to again have clear, clear questions to answer, and this is really what matters. And we discuss more things, but they are in the in the done board. So yeah, which we will be sharing. Cool, thank you. Sounds like a lot of practical things, really helpful, and a lot of new questions. So which is always good. More questions, more questions. And I hope that this next section, because we won't be able to answer all of these things now, will raise more of these critical questions. Um, so in this next breakout session, and, and I think we'll um, meet for 15 minutes in this breakout session now, um, we'll be discussing these next, these six questions. Um, I think to save enough time to discuss together, I'm going to uh, invite you to join the groups directly and explore a question in your group. So you can, uh, you should have an invite and you can join a group now. 
Okay, I think we're all back. So um, we will be going five minutes over. Um, if you need to leave on the hour, then we will be sending an update um, or a summary of, of everything that's been discussed today. But uh, obviously welcome you to stay for the last five moments. Let's jump straight into um, getting a, a report back from the note taker, shall we? And I'm gonna challenge you to summarise the most salient points in 60 seconds. So, Ash. Okay. Um, uh, we were talking about how to avoid indirect and hard to interpret assessments. Um, and Elaine was saying it's important to understand what the results are actually telling us. Um, for example, Carbon in the soil doesn't tell us about the fungal and bacterial elements in the soil. And then we were talking about different ways that we can measure soil carbon. Um, there's a method called Walkley Black, which measures carbon in the soil, but it also measures, it measures inorganic carbon um, as well as organic. So that's not perfect either. Uh, she was mentioning that, mentioning that there are X-ray measurements that you can do, but they're quite expensive. Um, and she's going to sit down and look at the rest of the test to tell us which ones she thinks could be hard to interpret. Uh, I also told the group about the training that we're planning to do with Elaine so that the camp managers can be skilled up on how to use microscopes and um, assess soil biology in compost and the soil that they're restoring. And then Daniel mentioned an open source material uh, or an open source tool to measure soil carbon, um, which looks very interesting and has sent a link. Um, and then he also suggested that we do a test on measuring the nutrients in plants, um, which is an example of nutrient cycling, which is a key ecosystem function that we haven't included in our framework. Okay, brilliant, thanks. Uh, Christina? I'll unmute myself. Um, so yeah, um, the question that we discussed was how do you determine which tests are appropriate for each camp? And um, Geneva started the conversation saying that this is a very challenging question uh, for Camp Paradise specifically because they work in different communities. So this idea of standardized uh, indicators which are adapted or are adaptable but still I still standardize to a certain extent, it's good. Um, but they have difficulties uh, because, yeah, the, implementing the monitoring and evaluation in the different zones they are working on is, is quite challenging. And we had a similar comment, uh, another comment, um, which was about uh, knowing specifically um, what are the tests that are uh, relevant in terms of understanding whether the camp is being successful in removing chemicals from the soil. Um, and uh, this is also a very specific question. And uh, something that was suggested to address the specific question was that, um, in general, uh, looking at the uh, diversity, the biodiversity and the plants that are growing on the site can really help us understand uh, whether the soil is uh, cleaning up or is still uh, loaded with, with chemicals. And that also generates an improvement, of course, of, this, of the situation could, uh, could help us understand um, whether uh, the site is, is being cleaned and the situation is generally improving. And so um, the idea uh, is that uh, the, the, the basic idea that we discussed is that the, um, the framework is is a standardized framework, but at the same time, uh, it's kind of flex flexible. So the, the camps should uh, be able to adapt it to their, their needs. So um, for each camp uh, that they have a need on focusing on the most relevant indicators, uh, they definitely should, uh, um, the, the, for the camps that they have a need, sorry, to focus on the indicators that are relevant for, um, 
for the uh, monitoring and evaluation collection at the foundation level, so the indicators that are very well listed in the framework, then of course uh, this is very important, but also it's important to respond to the local needs. So at the same time, uh, um, this specific needs can be added. So this, this framework is intended to be something uh, overarching and not something that is meant to, uh, yeah, to, to be like something uh, uh, very, very, very defined, but can be adapted. Sorry, I, <laughs> I, we discussed many things, so I hope I was uh, <laughs> clear in uh, uh, referring what we discussed. This were the main ideas. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Summarising all, I think it's really clear, Christina. But I think Mick has something that he wanted to just comment on really quickly. Really quickly, I think it was uh, an idea that's been hovering around for a while as well. But if we can, if we can really uh, understand what what we call the ecosystem function and what are these core indicators that we can measure across all the camps, so that then we can aggregate and have some really cool uh, figures of what the restoration camps movement is doing then having that basis established and usable for all of the camps, we can, of course, expand into more context specific indicators. And I really love that idea and I'm eager to, uh, to develop that further. OK. Um, Scott, do you want to feed back, report back? I'd love to. Um... So our, our question was, how can we improve um, the measuring of biodiversity um, at the camps? Um, and so some of the thoughts that came up in our discussion, one of the one big question that was brought up was um, in, in order to have consistent and meaningful testing, we have to determine and even negotiate what scale of uh, um, testing and surveying is feasible at a given camp, um, that a lot of the, the biodiversity measurement is gonna come through um, through the plots, the, the quadrats. Um, and so one is uh, mapping all of the quadrats and plots at, at a camp for consistent data collection. And another is strategy, finding strategies to help a camp um, scale up the number of uh, survey plots um, that they're able to observe. Um, and then another discussion we had was uh, also monitoring um, wildlife, uh, animals, and birds cited at the camp. And uh, it was mentioned that it's already in the framework or already in discussion for the final framework, but to encourage the camps to keep a daily diary of uh, animal and bird sightings that can offer um, valuable and fun to collect data on a long-term basis. Okay, um, thanks Scott. Melissa. I'll try to be fast. Uh, so group uh, breakout room number six was discussing how can we overcome ME implementation challenges at a camp level. And we had two main, main ideas. Uh, the two issues were communication and evaluation test flexibility for the certain types of climates and terrain that each camp is on. So uh, it actually, uh, Christina and I helped, I think had a lot of the same uh, feedback. So basically uh, just, if there could be a way to have alternative testing that gives you the same kinds of input specifically on monitoring that requires more preparation, they thought would be helpful. Also, how can each camp coordinator uh, pick the priority test for specific types of landscapes that they're currently on? Um, they think that um, it would be helpful to have a specific type of framework for each type of climate and you know soil that that would help guide them to say, okay, this test is the most important thing to start with. So that's, uh, that is also an important subject that we discussed. And sharing, sharing right now is really important um, about the technical issues from the very beginning of camp installation from the, the original camps. 
um, about their monitoring and which tools they had uh, problems with or had success with. And the best way to facilitate data sharing and making sure that all the data doesn't get lost between the camps. Um, and, and actually, there was one more thing, I'm sorry. And um, if there was a way to maybe have uh, yearly or bi-yearly surveys from camps and their campers so that uh, each camp could stay in the loop and know what's going on. So it's more in depth in the notes. <laughs> Great, and Kath? Yeah, um, our, our session uh, discussed uh, really how does the vision of camps build on the context of place? And um, the, the, the comments that we started um, the discussion off with was around the need um, for, for really to harvest information from the local community. So. Um, it's so important to, to understand the community, to go out into the community. So not just the people at the camps, but the people and the farmers and the, the, the people living in the village and, and everyone in the surrounding community um, to, to understand them and where they're at and, and to, to look at the, how that relationship is going to pan out between the camps and them. Um, and I think the, the point that was really highlighted there was that we're restoring relationships between the people and the land, which is why those um, interviews with, with people in the community are important. And then our conversation actually turned into a bit of a case study around functional forests in, in Turkey, um, which, which was an interesting uh, camp to look at as, as a case study because um, the guys there were saying that well, when you've got the opportunity to speak with people, you've got the relationship with the land, that's great, but it's more challenging when, when you don't. And this is what, what they're struggling with at the moment. Um, what they did mention that is they are they are producing things to, to fund their, their restoration activities at the camp and um, this is how they're engaging with local people in, in their activities um, and, and at which point Paul suggested well they actually are developing a system in response to their place where they're at at the moment so they're actually inadvertently they're actually finding the solution to the need to, to engage and to connect the, the people with the landscape. Um, uh, Kath, just want to leave enough time for Jan Hein as well. Do you mind? Right. No, that's fine. I'm going to wrap up right there. Okay. <laughs> Jan Hein? Yeah, thank you. We uh, were trying to answer the question, how long do we need to take measurements? Uh, and, and, and basically the outcome was that it's really a difficult question to answer. Uh, so we did not come to a specific time frame. Uh, one uh, discussion went into that some interventions uh, on, for example, syntropic farming, it, at the start, you see that a lot of things are happening. So, for example, you should be adaptive and measure more in a shorter term. And then later on, while the system settles, you know, you can take longer periods between the measurements. Uh, in general, the idea is that we should be adaptive in how we monitor and evaluate. So, uh, even if we measure of the length of the camp, we should be flexible on uh, what we measure and how often we measure things, because depending on the relevance over the time frame of that camp, so things do change, and you know we we need to be adaptable to it. It's a, a warning was said that you know if we if we add a specific time frame to it, it leads to a financial time commitment of the camps. You know, can they can they carry that? And uh, a recommendation basically that there are cheaper ways to monitor change over a longer period, for example, to take snapshots uh, and create a time lapse, uh, which, you know, it, it's, it's a one time investment, but it leads to an overview of the length of the project. Hmm. I'm amazed to hear how much has been discussed in what is actually a short time with everyone. So. Well, we're at the end now, but I'd like to thank everyone for, for all of your insight and the time that you've given and commitment to come together today. Um, and perhaps we can close with, we are over time, but perhaps we can close with, with a minute, a final reflection from John. And I think Peter has a final um, comment to make. John, do you have a final reflection you'd like to share? Yes, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're gonna have to spend the rest of our lives in doing this. So it would be really good if uh, we have a point, maybe it's Mick or maybe maybe Peter and Jan Hein can define where where the, 
the thought should go and everybody should continue to to consider these ideas because this is not something for any individuals to to decide it's up to a collective intelligence and i think we have um, this concept of living laboratories is so good and so useful and so practical that we can engage everyone and as soon as we learn anything it should spread to all the camps so thank you so much for all that you're doing around the world yeah that's that's perfectly said john and we will be launching the monitoring and evaluation framework on the 1st of June. So I think that will also be another uh, wonderful opportunity to come together and continue these discussions. Peter, do you like to? Yeah, I, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who came to this meeting um, and spending another two hours behind Zoom. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, it's not easy, I've realized, for trying to get the science in the hand, hands of non-scientifically trained people people is going to be a challenge. And Faye just mentioned the knowledge platform, which we hope can help there. Uh, I do want to particularly thank Mick because he did this as an internship and uh, did an awesome job in that internship in uh, developing a first series of tests, which are now subjected to your criticisms. And uh, so that's, that's also an awesome thing. And I want to thank Faye because I don't know, you facilitated, didn't facilitate many meetings in the, in the past, so you took on this challenge. So uh, uh, thanks for that. And everyone else for being here. I give it back to Faye to bring it to a close. Well, I wanted to also say another big thank you for John for pulling together all your friends and, and experts and just thank you to everyone. Let's keep it up. <laughs>